I like to think of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, who carried a revolver, who had a scar on her head from a rock thrown by a slave master because she talked back, and who had a ransom on her head of thousands of dollars, and who was never caught, and who defied the law because the law was wrong. I like to think of her. I like to think of her, especially when I think of the problem of feeding children. The legal answer to the problem of feeding children is 10 free lunches every month. Being equal in the child's real life to eating lunch every other day, Monday but not Tuesday. I like to think of the president eating lunch Monday but not Tuesday. And when I think of the president and the law and the problem of feeding children, I like to think of Harriet Tubman. And sometimes I think of the president and other men, men who practice the law, who revere the law, who make the law, who enforce the law, who hide behind and operate through and feed themselves at the expense of starving children <laughs> because of the law. Men who sit in paneled offices and think about vacations and tell women whose care it is to feed children, not to be hysterical. Not to be hysterical, as in the word hysterikos, the Greek for womb suffering, not to suffer in their wounds, not to care, not to bother the men, because the men want to think of other things and do not want to take the women seriously. I want men to take us seriously. I want them to think about Harriet Tubman and remember, remember, she was beat by a man and she lived. And she lived to redress her grievances. And she lived in swamps and wore the clothes of a man, bringing hundreds of fugitives from slavery, and was never caught, and led an army, and won a battle, and defied the laws because the laws were wrong. I want men to take us seriously. I'm tired wanting them to think about right and wrong. I want them to feel fear now, as I have felt suffering in my womb. And I want men to know there is always a time. There is always a time to make right what is wrong, and that time is beginning. Thank you, Viney Burroughs, remembering one of the greatest people of all times, Harriet Tubman. We have so much to learn from her life, but let's face it, a lot of us grew up in comparative innocence. We even retired to our radios and television sets to get some drama into our lives. Our next star is one of those marvelous actors who makes house calls. No doubt you remember Irene ba a Daly from her award-winning performance in The Subject Was Roses. You can catch her almost any day working the soaps on TV. But her real love of life is her own one-woman show of feminist material. Here now is Irene Daly to bring you the continuing saga of the hard times of Sally Rand, whom we discover now in Chicago as she struggles hard to be raunchy during the Depression.
was 26 in 1930, a nice age to start savoring things. I was born in the last naive moment America was ever to enjoy between the Spanish-American War and the First World War. Things were F, F, and G, sweet, simple, and girlish. Virtue triumphed, honesty prevailed. It poorly prepared us who were, grew up in this innocent way for the 30s. Suddenly, all the copybook maxims were turned backwards. How could it be that a man who had been at a job for 30 years couldn't have a job? How could it be that a business that had been in business for a lifetime isn't anymore? Friends of mine who went to Princeton, Harvard, Yale, jumped out of windows with accuracy. <laughs> I was booked on the Orpheum circuit in an act called Sally and Her Boys. The Depression canceled our bookings. I was stranded in Chicago. Every hotel in the loop was in 77B. That's being in bankruptcy to Uncle Sam, legitimately. I didn't have any money. I couldn't pay my hotel bill. I didn't have food or whiskey or anything. I went down to see the management and I said, I never ran out on a hotel bill in my life. I haven't got a job, but I'll get one. Meantime, I can't pay you what I owe you. They said, don't worry, there's nobody in the hotel anyway. <laughs> one of the boys in my act, Tony, was from Chicago. He said, don't worry. All my uncles are stagehands and the rest are bootleggers. Pick out a nightclub you want to work. We'll work. I went to look at those little freak places with their postage stamp stages. Up to this time, the most sexy thing I'd ever done was Scheherazade in the ballet. I thought a girl who went on stage without stockings was a hussy. I got the job, $75 a week, because Tony's uncles were delivering whiskey for Frankie, the owner. Well, I had to find a number to do. I couldn't do a toe dance there. I walked down to Maybelle Shearer's costume shop on Warbash. She had a lot of old fans laying on the counter. I picked up a pair of those feathered fans, the kind that prima donnas use to hit the high notes with. <laughs> Anytime any female picks up a fan, she instantly becomes a femme fatale, a coquette. I've seen it happen down in the Ozarks at Baptist revival meetings. A lady in a poke bonnet and calico dress picks up a palmy fan and instantly becomes the queen of Sheba. I picked up a pair of fans and looked in the mirror. I smiled my inscrutable smile and the whole thing worked. Suddenly, I saw the fans did exactly what I wanted. Hit it, Professor. Life is just a bowl of cherries. Don't take it serious. Life's too mysterious. You work, you sleep, you worry so. But you can't take your go when you go, go, go. Repeating it. Talk 
too much. I'm quite bright, so it's interesting, but nevertheless, I talk too much. You see, I'm already saying more than I should. I mean, men hate it for a woman to blurt out, I'm bright. They think she's really saying, I'm brighter than you are. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, that is what I'm saying. I am brighter than even the brightest men I know. That's why it's a mistake to talk too much. Men fall behind and feel challenged and grow hostile. So, when I'm very attracted to a man, I make it a point to talk more slowly than I would to one of my woman friends. And and because I guide him along gently from insight to insight, he ends up being terribly impressed with his own brilliance and with mine for being able to keep up with him. And he tells me I'm the first woman he's ever met who's as interesting as one of his boyfriends. That's love. Dolly. Let go, Dolly. <laughs> Dolly, uh, you've got to learn to let go. <laughs> love is more than more, uh, love is more than mere possession, Dolly. I, it's, uh, the but ladies make a noise. Everybody says don't, everybody says don't, everybody says don't get out of line. When they say that then, lady, that's a sign. Nine times out of ten, baby, you're doing just fine. Yes, I say do. I say break a few rules, it's good for you, I say. around for miracles that's the way the world is made i insist on miracles you can do them miracles nothing to them i say don't don't be afraid yes. <laughs> you know when i was um thinking about doing this evening's performance, I was trying to think of songs, you know, that would be appropriate tonight. And it was a little difficult for me to come up with them because in the, uh, in the years when I was growing up, they used to write music for women that, well, like this. There's a somebody I'm longing to see. I hope that he turns out to be someone over me I'm a little lamb who's lost in the wood I know I could always be good to one who watch over me you see here we had this young girl who was just entering into womanhood just blossoming and the thing that she was taught to hope for and dream most of is to find some big strapping man who would take care of her and treat her just like a little girl. Well, we're all tired of that, right? Why? Well, in the words of that indomitable feminist, Henry Iggins, you see, women are irrational. That's all there is to that. Their heads are full of cotton, hay, and rags. They're nothing but exasperating, irritating, agitating, vacillating, calculating, maddening, and fury. Oh, that does feel so good. <laughs> Ladies, why, why can't a woman be more like a man? Yes, why can't a woman be more like a man? Men are so honest, so thoroughly square, eternally noble, historically fair. Who, when you win, will always give your back a pack? 
can't a woman be like that? Why does everyone do as the others do? Can't a woman learn to use her head? Why must they do everything their fathers do? Why don't they grow up like their fathers instead? Yes, why can't a woman take after a man? Men are so pleasant, so easy to please. Whenever you're with one, you're always at ease. Would you be wounded if I didn't speak for hours? Would you be livid if I had a drink or two? Would you be wounded if I never sent you flowers? No, why can't a woman be like you? One man in a million may shout a bit. Now and then there's one with slight defects. One perhaps whose truthfulness you doubt a bit. Oh, ladies. Fill in your own blanks. But by and large, they are a marvelous sex. Yes, why can't a woman behave like a man? Men are so friendly, good-natured and kind. A better companion you'll never find. If I were hours late for dinner, would you bellow? If I forgot your silly birthdays, would you fuss? Would you complain if I took out another fellow? No, why can't a woman be like us? Yes. There's more music coming, written by Carol Frankel and Lois Wise, performed by Hattie Winston, Nancy Andrews, and Roz Harris. It's called Female Assertiveness Training. I think I know what it's about. I think I've been doing it for a while. But I'll be listening hard anyway, just in case I can learn a thing or two. Female Assertiveness Training. They had grown into a vast movement, and things finally began to change. One of our latter-day pioneers is here with us to read a poem she has written. It's my honor to present one of the great stars of our times. Her work and her commitment to others has been an inspiration to all of us. Ruby D. Calling all women, calling all women, calling all women to steal away to our secret place. Have a meeting face to face. Look at the facts and determine our pace. Calling all women. We want to reach first and second and third world women. Come together, women inside, outside the power structure. Working women, welfare women, women who feel alienated and isolated, women who are all frustrated, who have given up women, women questioning women, women unpolarized and unorganized, ostracized, tired of being and penalized. Come, help us start to bridge the gaps, racial, cultural, or generation. We want action and veneration. These men, these men, they just ain't doing it. <laughs> they had hundreds of years, now they're about to ruin it. <laughs> kitchen office, kitchen office, ex-prison women, Kitchen office, ex-prison women, singing, dancing, diapering women, old and young and middle-aged women. Take a subway, grab a cab, ride a bike, or pick them up and lay them down. Just make this scene. Now is the time for convolutions. Let's all search and find solutions. Here and now, or future. Afford a schism. We got to get together or die. Call it all. In Libya, the men curl their hair. And Want to? Sorry. Right, Want to? Yeah, <laughs> Don't be sorry. Fifteen. Huh? Somebody almost walked off 
with all of my stuff. Not my poems or a dance I gave up in